Who is the Churchill Club? That is what I will be trying to answer today. First, however, we must discuss who the Nazis are. Now, I'm sure most of you are aware of the Nazis, but just as a refresher. The National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi Party, grew into a mass movement in Germany through totalitarian means from 1933 to 1945 under the leadership of Adolf Hitler. This group expressed its taste towards the Treaty of Versailles, which ended World War I and wanted to restore Germany to its former glory. Germany repaired itself under Nazi rule and was eventually in a place to invade its eastern neighbor, Poland. This invasion marked the beginning of World War II. As Nazi Germany gained power, they continued to invade more and more countries eventually invading Denmark. This is where our story begins. At the outset of World War II, in September 1939, Denmark declared itself neutral. For most of the war, the country was a protectorate, and then an occupied territory of Germany. The decision to occupy Germany was taken in Berlin on 17th of December 1939. On April 9th, 1940, Germany occupied Denmark in Operation Wasernabund. The Nazis continued to go after Jews while in Denmark. They were also just generally unwanted, and most Danes abhorred their presence. Resistance groups sprung up in Denmark, one of which being the RAF Club, named after the British Royal Air Force, started by 14-year-old Knud Peterson. Remember that name. This group started small acts of sabotage, such as cutting Nazi phone lines. In April of 1949, Peterson moved to Aalborg and formed the Churchill Club there. The RAF Club continued in Odense. The Churchill Club was a similar anti-Nazi sabotage group. They named their group the Churchill Club after the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill, who they admired greatly. The group consisted of eight members who were Knud Peterson, Jens Bu Peterson, Morgens Fjallrup, Eagle Astrup Fredrickson, Helge Milo, Uff Darkett, Moggins Thompson, and Bjorg Oldenorf. The group's goal was rather simple, to hurt the Nazis. Rather than protest, these boys carefully orchestrated several major sabotage acts, as well as some smaller in-the-moment acts. It took lots of bravery, smarts, and patience to stand up to the evil Nazi regime, even in the small way that they did. Their impact was not insignificant. These boys went through multiple dangerous situations, at one point even having bullets fired at them. Calling them boys doesn't even seem fitting, because what these teenage boys did would prove that they were men. In February 1942, the boys of the Churchill Club devised a plan to raid the Futch's construction office at Alborg Airport, an important Luftwaffe base housing 150 bombers used to attack Tarbits in Norway and to protect German ships. The Futch's construction company was a local company paid by the German army to build hangars and runways. The boys secretly got past the guarded bridge and made their way to the offices and set fire inside the main office destroying blueprints and records. The building did not burn down, but it was their first large-scale sabotage. The Churchill Club always took the opportunity to destroy German vehicles, sometimes by bending the radiator or dropping a lit match into the fuel tank. The Churchill Club would patrol the town on a regular basis and take any opportunity to steal German soldiers' guns while their backs were turned. Being unfamiliar with guns, they never used them, but they would stockpile them and turn them into homemade explosives for sabotage missions. On May 2, 1942, the Churchill Club, using discs for mortar grenades, blew up the Alborg Rail Yard, which was the town's main Nazi base. The boys utilized the weapons they had stolen earlier and turned them into grenades. This mission was simply to put those grenades to test. A group of the boys snuck inside while two of them stayed on the lookout and distracted the guards. The railroad cars that they blew up contained airplane wings, machinery, and Swedish iron ore likely destined for German war effort. Danish firemen were slow to put out the flames, fearing additional explosions. This was one of their most successful attacks. The boys' acts of sabotage eventually came to an end when two of the boys stole a pistol out of the coat pocket of a Nazi officer at a cafe. Two of the boys were arrested, which consequently led to the arrest of the other boys. A judge gave them sentences ranging from six months to three years. However, while in jail, a group of the boys snuck out for 19 consecutive nights through a window that was cut open. They committed more small acts such as destroying vehicles and stealing weapons. 
One of the greatest parts about the boys' arrests was when the commissioner told the boys' parents that what they had been up to over the past six months. None of the parents had any idea. Most of these boys came from affluent families, and their doctor, lawyer, business owner parents have never been in a police station before. The police needed information and needed the boys to talk. All they had to do was offer Kano the cigarette, and they got most of the information they needed. In 1950, the boys were invited to a luncheon held by Eb Monk at the Danish castle to honor them. All the boys but Jen were able to make it. It was a sort of reunion for them. After the luncheon, the boys were invited to a parade featuring Winston Churchill, and during this parade, Churchill finally acknowledged the boys face to face. Knud said he acknowledged them as if they were generals in his military. The boys inspired other groups, like the groups who committed minor sabotage in Poland. Although these acts are typically of the nonviolent nature, falsifying documents, messing up Nazi propaganda, and vandalizing Nazi property, all helped to bring an end to the war. In many ways, these boys were one of the many examples of groups of people standing up to injustice. They were the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s, there were the anti-war groups that opposed the Vietnam War, there were the hippies that stood against the modern consumeristic ways of life. All of these groups have one thing in common, they stood up for what they believed in, which takes bravery and courage. These boys were exceptionally brave though. At any moment, they could have been shot by Nazi guards for trespassing. It didn't matter to them. What mattered was their cause, fighting the Nazis. And maybe they fought the Nazis because they were young and couldn't join the army, so they wanted to fight against them in whatever way they could. Maybe they just did it for fun. Whatever the reason is, these boys are truly an inspiration to all people, and especially young men, to stand up and fight for what they believe in. Most of the information I got was from the book, The Boys Who Challenged Hitler, by Philip Hughes. This book consists of some of his own research, but mostly it's stories from Knud Peterson himself. He conducted many interviews with the leader of the Churchill Club, and without this book, this story would most likely be lost in history.